Hello and welcome to Dialect. I'm Tony Gosling. Dialect is Bristol's first podcast set up with a grant from the Scarman Trust in 2002 and has been broadcast on Preston, Swindon and St Albans Community Radio. Bristol Community FM's Chair Ali Grant and Manager Pat Hart have, however, suspended Dialect indefinitely due to a nearly 30-minute long excerpt from a speech by Bible scholar Gail Ripplinger for the time being, but we are hoping to have it back on BCFM soon. You're listening to dialectradio.co.uk. My name's Nick Much. I'm currently an independent journalist based in London, but I'm originally from New Zealand and I was an undergraduate since four years at Oxford, specifically at Christchurch, which is one of the most aristocratic colleges and quite a lot of the Bullingdon members come from them. So I actually ended up knowing knowing a few socially. Now, how I got started on this particular investigation is actually working with the German newspaper, Der Spiegel, who one day came down to Oxford and they came to the offices of the student newspaper I was working for at the time. And they said, hey, we're looking for someone to help us out with an investigation into this, or if anyone knows anyone... I just decided that I'd take it on and I ended up getting really, really interested in the club, not just in the club as in some of the exploits or what they've done, but also the history of the club and what this means about, you know, the British ruling class and the aristocracy and British social history. And, well, how I effectively made my break with the club, and this this is on record, I published this in The Independent in May, is when we were looking around, I finding the tailor, Eden Ravenscroft. Now, this is the tailor, the, the Oxford branch of which makes the, the famous tailcoats, you know, the £3,500 um, costume, effectively, they wear. A penguin costume is actually how George Osborne referred to it later in life. But And in the back, they have an entire archive of photos, maybe oh, 25 or... 30, dating between about 1925 and 2010. Just all over the walls, they included one that had never been seen before of David Cameron in 1988, which has gotten, a fair, it's gotten published a fair few times now. And also other ones, including the famous one of George Osborne, uh, others of various senior figures, like this one there of Rupert Stones that I tweeted out recently. He's the CEO of Serco. Another one of Jacob Roth's child from 1959 that I'm going to run run pretty soon. How come there's been uh, not a lot of talk about them in the press recently? Because I I noticed this a few years ago now. uh, The Daily Mail published famously published a uh, picture of uh, Cameron in his penguin suit uh, as a Bullingdon Club member. Uh, But uh, I understand that actually there's quite a lot of pressure from the Bullingdon Club for the national newspapers not to allow these to appear in their pages. Why is that? Well, let me tell you something quite interesting. Uh, Do you know? You know who Lord Rothermere, of course. His son is currently uh, a member of the Bullingdon Club. There's a, there's a nice little tidbit for you. And so uh, may, maybe that has something to What's do with that. Also, What's his name? What's his name? So Lord Rothermere's son. Son's name is Veer Harmsworth. Oh, Veer Harmsworth. And hang on, because they're the publishers of the Daily Mail. So maybe his son has had a word with Daddy and said, oh, we'd rather he didn't publish these. I, I can't say, I, I can't point out anything more than that, but if people want to make those inferences, they could be perfectly legitimate. There's also the fact that, or let's face it, they're extremely embarrassing for a lot of the Conservative Party. And one of the reasons is because, and, and this, is, this is one of the points that I've made in the past, is in 2011, when the, when the riots were going on, you know, Cameron was giving this big speech about how we need to mend Britain's morally broken society, et cetera, et cetera. We need tough justice for these jobs and blah, blah, blah. And they look like awfully hypocritical to be associated with a club that is well known for vandalism, effectively. And not only that, I think they're also embarrassed to the extent of quite how many senior figures knew each other and made connections at such a young age. It means they have real trouble, you know, painting this. British society or the Tory party as, as, as any sort of meritocracy. 
um, the members, they seem to be newspaper editors um, and uh, leader writers for newspapers, also bankers. You mentioned Serco, who are taking over a lot of the um, jobs that used to be b- done by public uh, bodies, public services, government departments. They're a kind of uh, privatisation of government people. Diplomats, uh, can you just give us your own view of, of um, some of the types of people that the B- Bullingdon Club members go on to in later life? Because it almost seems like this club uh, is the club you join if you want to have success in politics or any other field. Go back to 1951, which is one of the earliest photos that I've got or that was hanging on the wall. One of the men in there is Anthony Ackland, or Anthony Ackland, sorry. He went on to be ambassador to the United States under Thatcher and then took over the position of headmaster of Eton College, Eton College where most of the Bullingdon members come from. Jacob Rothschild, as I said, is worth some he's worth it worth nearly five billion pounds now. A lot of it is inherited family money. You also get members from some of the most significant families in in British business. For instance, we've got Valentine Guinness of the Brewing Dynasty, a member of the Sainsbury family, W.H. Uh, Smith, who's here to the, book, to the bookshop chain, current boyfriend of, of one of the uh, girls from ABBA. The list just goes on and on and on and on. on. I mean, I remember reading something by Toby Young saying, oh, not a, you know, no one else in... Cameron and Johnson's photo has gone on to anything. They've all been quite obscure. But no, one of them's a managing director at Goldman Sachs. In what planet is going on to be one of the, a very senior figure in an incredibly impressive investment bank, you know, not amounting to anything? It sounds to me as if they're deliberately trying to play it down if they're saying that the boss of Goldman Sachs hasn't gone on to be a powerful person. Uh, what about uh, uh, the... Not, not the... Not the boss, I'll just... Well, like what, a managing director. So okay, well, still quite high up the chain. he does sound quite high up the chain. Um, but uh, what about the comparisons that some people have made uh, between the Skull and Bones Society in the United States at Yale University? Because they have a similar thing there, don't they, where they get tapped. They get woken up in the middle of the night uh, and really demanded to come to a meeting and then they get uh, selected uh, to join this club and they can turn it down if they wish. But is uh, any idea if there's a, any similarity between the Skull and Bones, which uh, famously you had both uh, George Bush and John Kerry, who were supposed to be standing against each other as Republican and Democrat presidents a few years ago, both being members of the same uh, Skull and Bones society. Uh, any comparisons to the Bullingdon? So I've never looked into the Skull and Bones Society myself, so I don't claim any expertise on that. However, the Skull and Bones Society was originally founded on the model of the Bullingdon Club, like Harvard was founded on Cambridge, for instance. All, the, all those American colleges were founded on these kind of Oxbridge models. Actually, there's a very there's a very interesting article that was published in 1913 in the New York Times that actually made this exact that comparison, I'm happy to give you a link to the text is still worth checking out. Uh, but I think one of the differences is that it seems that, and, and I don't necessarily know this for, for, for sure, is that America is so big that in the Skull and Bone Society, people can go all over the country, it's a little bit more disparate, whereas in the Bullingdon Club, people make these connections and they keep these connections for the rest of their career, you know, 20, 30 years later, they still, I, I can tell you for one thing, and, and this, is, this is reasonably well known, uh, that in 2008, for instance, the 1987 club with Cameron and Johnson, six members of them, this is according to a Daily Mail diary piece at the time, regrouped for a fundraiser for Boris Johnson's mayoral campaign. So I, I, I can't really speak with authority on the skull and bone situation, but there certainly are some... Similarity, but I do think the main distinguishing feature of the Bullingdon Club is quite how close the members remain later in life. Well, of course, that could be quite handy if one of your colleagues from the Bullingdon Club happens to be a banker. They may be able to tap into limitless amounts of cash for you. I'm sure. I mean, I, I can't, again, I can't point directly to any funding connections, with the exception of this one fundraiser that was, that was made. But also... 
Let's have a look, say, at Cameron's club. That's what most well known, and, and, and let's see what some of the other people have been able to do for him. So one of the chief leader writers at the Financial Times is, is was president of the club when, when Cameron was a member. Now, just before the election, the chief leader by the Financial Times in, endorsed Cameron. Now, they claim that it was written by him, and you can, you can believe that if, if you like. There's another member, another member, a guy called Sebastian James, who's the CEO of Dixon's Car Phone, worth an enormous amount of money. Cameron appointed him to the head of a panel that was overseeing state school spending. I mean, it, it, it's also not only not only that is the fact that people try and they try and play down the bullying and saying, oh, you know, it's just something we did when we were young. But no, actually. Many old members, up to say five, ten years after they graduated, go back to the club for their events. There's a, there's a good, great photo, I've seen it, and it's actually in the public domain, of George Osborne at a Bullingdon Club event in 1997, while he was at the time working on John Major's re-election campaign. You can find, for a couple of years ago, photos of one of the presidents at the time at a dinner with Boris Johnson. It's just crazy how narrow this clip can be okay what about what they actually get up to i mean we've heard all about the uh japes where they take over a, a restaurant they get drunk uh, they smash the place up and then um someone comes around as a, it used to be george osborne of course in the bullington club days with a checkbook and says basically they'll write out a blank check to the owner for any damage that's done but are there any other um uh ideas you've got about uh, what the Bullingdon Club members actually get up to? So a lot of the stories, there's, be, there's become a sort of kind of mythology around the clubs and a lot of that kind of outlandish stories have kind of gotten around. The, the, the basic point of it, which is that they get drunk, smash up restaurants, or you bet they'll, they'll just smash up the cutlery and sometimes the furniture and at one time about Seven or eight years ago, they set fire. They, they found a photo of another rival club called the Stoics on the on the wall of some pub, and they just set fire to it. Um, they also are well known for, and, you know, you can judge them on this if you like, but um, considering kind of Cameron and George Osborne's pretenses to morality, they frequently hire hire strippers for their events. That's just a, that's just a well known thing that's attested to. Quite a lot, uh, quite a lot of former members. Some of the stories that have gotten round about them, I haven't been able to find any evidence for. Like there was a story a couple of years back about them burning a fifty-pound note in front of a tram. Now I did looked into this quite closely, and I couldn't find any evidence for it. And not only that, and this is slightly in their defence, the things they tend to do, while they tend to be very thoughtless and very sort of outrageous and uncaring. They seem to do things that are deliberately malicious, like that story suggested, not as often. I mean, you can make plenty of ethical judgments about them, but there are some stories about them that I think are exaggerated. Nick, I noticed that uh, you've uh, uncovered uh, several members of the Bullying Club that people didn't realise were members from these old photographs including Cecil Rhodes maybe you could say something about him because I noticed that there's a, actually a campaign in Oxford at the moment uh, to get his statue removed because of the uh, effectively genocide that he's uh, accused of uh, in being involved in Britain's colonial history so one of the things that I don't think often realise is quite how much club the influence how much influence the club used to have in the 19th century and how much influence it's actually had over time. Cecil Rhodes is by no means the only significant figure. For instance, one of the, a prime minister from the 19th century, at least one prime minister, um, Archibald Primrose, the Earl of Rosary, was a member. Randolph Churchill, who is Winston Churchill's father and was the exchequer, he was a member. Cecil Rhodes was a member in 1877. And what I think this shows is that this sort of club has almost been a, a kind of a finishing school for a lot of Britain's elite for quite some time. 
One other document I managed to get hold of, for instance, was a full club membership list between 1850 and 1899. Now, there's at least 100 peers in that, at least 50 members of the House of Commons. The, the, the post of First Lord of the Admiralty, I managed to identify five people in that list who were, who were in that post. Um, uh, as I said, a Prime Minister, a Chancellor, there's a couple of foreign secretaries. And one thing that I think this shows is that this idea is it, it, quite how much things haven't changed since the 19th century. In the 19th century, all these powerful people went through the club, and now all these powerful people are still going through the club again, or all this kind of time later. It's a little bit like the 21st century is mirroring the, the class system of the 19th century, or at least it might be emerging that way. Um, well, I imagine Bullingdon Club members and those that send their kids to Oxford and the, who then join the Bullingdon would say, well, this is the way it's always been, and um, actually we want the best for our kids, uh, whether that's a good Oxford ed- education. And the Bullingdon Club is actually a good way to, for them to link up and network with other people who are potentially going to be powerful in the future from wealthy families. So what's the problem? Well, I mean, that's exactly, it's perfectly in their self-interest to do that, and I don't even necessarily judge someone who joins the bullying club. Actually, I knew a couple of them, and uh, per- personal, and they, they, can, they can be very personable people. And what I just think, that, and so I'm, I'm not judging them on an individual level, and actually, I think you can make a, an argument that, okay, you know, this is just what people did when they were young, we should forget what this all is. But what the same time kind of gets me is the fact that they all then, then turn around, they try and have the photographs of the press and stop them being published, they try and deny the events that go on. And so what tends to happen is it's not just they tend to make these networks, But another factor of it is that when they all get into this club or similar clubs and they go around smashing up places together and indulging in this kind of behaviour, then they all will have effectively influence over each other at at, at times in the future because they'll all know what each other's done and they'll probably have some kind of influence on these people in, in ways that might not be good for the rest of the country, even if it's good for them. So what you're saying is effectively that um, their loyalty may be more to the club than it is to the rest of us, especially if they're involved in uh, public life. But you've mentioned a few other clubs. Is the Bullingdon not the only one then? So, no. There are, so actually, drinking clubs are very, very common in Oxford. Um, there's another one. So there's, uh, but, but how the structure basically works is there's, there's a club called the Gridiron, which biggest there's maybe about there's, there can be over 50 people in that if you can ask just ask you to talk about which is asking you about other clubs not just the bullingdon it's not the only one is it so basically how how, how it all how the structure anyway works is there's, there's one club called the gridiron club is that i don't know 50 or so people in that and what they tend to do is then the other clubs of which there are so there's the there's one called the frat there's another one called the stone now, the Stoics is actually quite a lot more people are joining that now. And one of the reasons a lot of people are turning the Bullingdon Club down now simply because there's so much publicity of the current Conservative government. And so a lot of people are now joining this club called the Stoics, which is a newer club. The, the kind of people are the same people who would join the Bullingdon, but don't quite want that level of, of sort of scrutiny. So I couldn't really name anyone well known. There's also the Piers Gaveston Society, which has now become pretty well known due to the allegations about Cameron's indiscretions there. And there are, although there are, there are other clubs at Cambridge, Cambridge Apostles is a pretty well, no, well known group. There's a Cambridge equivalent of the Bullingdon as well. And that's called the Pit Club, and they often actually have crossovers. So you know you can find that they, they both actually started as cricket clubs, or at least the Bullingdon did. De, de, I'm not entirely sure about the Pit Club. For instance, you can find photos of cricket matches between between the two clubs. There's another club in Cambridge called the Athenaeum Club. Right, you can find some very nice photographs. One of them was published recently in, in Lord Ashcroft's book of Cameron in his Bullingdon uniform at ball in Cambridge. And I'm sure, I'm sure there are there are other clubs like these at at other universities. And it, 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 it's a fairly fairly consistent feature of of the undergraduate experience. 
Can you just tell us a bit about your uh, how we can follow your work online, Nick? So, uh, you know, how can we stay in touch with some of your research on these people? I'm mainly a journalist with Byline.com. You can follow me on my Twitter handle is at Nick T. Much, M-U-T-C-H. And most of my work will be published there. I've published uh, a few pieces on the on the club in the past in The Independent. Uh, ran a couple of pieces about them in May. But I've got one very, very major piece coming up and that will be with the Daily Beast, and that should be coming out within the next couple of days. This is a proper full several thousand words about the club and its history and who's been in it and everything like that. So that's really the big one to wait for. But the photos I'll be running one or two at a time on byline with the explanations of who's in, what it means, and, and, and what they got up to. If I could sort of end on, on one final thing, and this is um, the uh, one of the things that's often brought up about about the photos and whether they should be published and whether it's a, it's okay to judge kind of our politicians based on their university lives. One thing I want to say, and this is my justification, is that these photographs are, in my opinion, the historical documents. They're extremely interesting windows into the formative years of some of the most powerful people in the country and how the, how the, how they were educated, the connections they made there, how those connections affect them later in life. You're perfectly welcome to look at the photographs and go, you know what, I don't care. I don't care what these people did. I care. I base them on their competence of running the country now. But fundamentally, I think historical documents that are just important to know for the sake of what the country's past was and what the country's future is going to be and bring judgments from there. OK, Nick, thanks very much. Bye. All the best. Thanks very much. Wednesday, uh, I interviewed a chap called Nick Much. He's a freelance journalist, and he's been looking into the Bullingdon Club. And he's very, very worried that we're actually going back to a kind of uh, Victorian Britain, not just uh, through some of the values that they were in those days of workhouses and things like that, but actually through the way that people get to power, not through democracy, but through mm-hmm. clubs like the Bullingdon. And uh, he's pointed out, for example, that there's been very little coverage of the Bullingdon Club uh, in the Daily Mail, which was the paper that originally published the pictures of Cameron and George Osborne and uh, Boris Johnson in the Bullingdon Club mm. in their in their uh, these penguin outfits of theirs mm. that cost I think three and a half thousand pounds each. Those, uh, but but uh, but that but Via Harmsworth, mm. who's the son of the owner of the Daily Mail, is now in the Bullingdon Club. <laughs> so perhaps that's why the Mail has has reined back its coverage. <laughs> Worth mentioning also that Jacob Rothschild from the banking family and David Dimbleby, who chairs BBC Question Time every mm. week, a former Bullingdon Club member. So let's have a little listen now to an, an excerpt from this. And if you want to hear the full interview, you can hear it on our dialect show, which has been pulled from bcfm uh, hopefully be back soon uh, but that's on dialectradio.co.uk uh, and you can download that as a podcast but here's an excerpt now from my interview with nick much one of the things that i don't think often realized is how much influence the club used to have in the 19th century and how much influence it's actually had over time Cecil Rhodes is by no means the only significant figure for instance from the 19th century at least one prime minister Archibald Trimrose, the Earl of Rosary, was a member. Randolph Churchill, who is Winston Churchill's father and was with the Exchequer, he was a member. Cecil Rose was a member in 1877. And what I think this shows is that this sort of club has almost been a, a kind of a finishing school for a lot of Britain's elite for quite some time. One other document I managed to get hold of, for instance, was a full club membership list between 1850 and 1899. Now, there's at least 100 peers in that, at least 50 members of the House of Commons. The post of First Lord of the Admiralty, I managed to identify five people in that list who were were on that post. The Prime Minister, Chancellor, a couple of foreign secretaries. And one thing that I think this shows is that it's quite how much things haven't changed since the 19th century. In the 19th century, all these powerful people went through the club, and now all these powerful people are still going through the club again, or all this kind of time later. It's a little bit like the 21st century is mirroring the, the class system of the 19th century, or at least it might be emerging that way. Well, um, we, th- these kind of clubs exist in all elite universities. So you've got the Skull and Bones Societies in Yale and Harvard and so on. Bullingdon Club is our version of it. And um, 
they, they are part of the networking that's carried out within the ruling class, if you like. I mean, so, Skull and Bones, I understand that they have to they have to lie in a coffin and swear to various things. And, so, and it sounds bizarre, but all of these things are part of joining an inner group who, yeah. who will then later on run the country. Well, so John the- Kerry's a member of Skull and Bones and Bush. And, of course, Bush, uh, Kerry actually beat Bush in the, in the, uh, the, the election, but he, as a member of Skull and Bones, threw the election. He should have actually said Bush didn't win the, the, the 2003 election, but he didn't. And, of course, he then gets the reward of being the vice president for Obama later on. And all of these kind of... The thing about the Bullingdon Club in Britain, though, is it's very much conservative territory. Skull and Bones covers virtually the whole spectrum of, of political forces, uh, you know, mainstream political forces in the US. Bullingdon Club historically very much uh, basically you've got to go to Eton and Oxford to be in the Bullingdon Club well, the other I, was, I went to Oxford but I wasn't, I wasn't didn't go to Eton oh, you so to nobody be- would ever have asked me to join the Bullingdon Club not that I would ever have wanted to join it but these things exi- what's amazing to me is that we have got an old Etonian government in Britain like, the, like we had throughout the 19th and 18th centuries and the system with first past the post and all the rest of it is simply not fit for purpose. It's long ago become a, a, an anachronism. And on a, on a minority of the vote, the Conservative government, run by ex-Eton, ex-Oxford people, are running the country, as they did throughout most of and the British Annie, Empire. One, one of the things that Nick pointed out in that interview to me was that actually the headmasters of Eton, or almost many of them, are also bullied club members. So it's almost like recycling its own uh, system. Uh, even he's talking there about Cecil Rhodes, 100 lords, 50 MPs, the military and the banking elite. It doesn't seem like a lot of change has changed since Victorian times even. We like to think of ourselves as this great pinnacle of democracy in this country, but in actual fact our democratic system is broken. It's not really that democratic at all in terms of the resulting government from a vote in terms of who got what amount of the vote share before you even get into who those politicians are in the first place it's not democratic it's not representative of the country the goal is to destroy all existing religions save theirs all existing governments save theirs and shackle the mob in a system of eternal oppressive debt chained to a computer for the rest of their life in a propagandized world to make them believe that they are happy in this system. We start with the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, whispering omerta, omerta under his breath. Are we being ruled by a bunch of the country's most thuggish toffs from Eton and the Bullingdon Club? Journalist Nick Much recently graduated from Oxford and he didn't like what he saw. And he joins me on the line now. Hi, Nick. Welcome to The Politics Show. Hi there, Tony. How are you? I'm fine, Nick. Thanks. Uh, First of all, I suppose I should ask you, uh, what was it about your experience at at Oxford and what really triggered your interest in the Bullingdon Club? So, I mean, I originally got involved just because quite a lot of national papers. In particular, I did some work for the Spiegel, the German weekly. But it was something that was kind of very obviously going on everywhere. People were always kind of talking about the Bullingdon Club in hushed whispers. Everyone had kind of seen the photographs of David Cameron. A couple of them got in trouble with the police when I was there. But no one actually knew anything about the club, any of its traditions, any of its history, anything like that. And so I decided, well, something needs to be done about that. So I decided to really, really try and dig deep into the club all its histories, all its traditions, but not just that, to work out the links between what people in the club were like then and what they're doing now. And if you can see, and one of the points I try and make is that a lot of what happens with the Bullingdon Club isn't just sort of useful indiscretions. These people go on to maintain the connections they made in the Bullingdon Club 20, 30 years later when they're in high positions in journalism, politics, wherever, financial institutions list goes on now i know that uh, one of the things that's really helped in your research massively is discovering a whole load of these bullingdon club photographs because uh one of the first pictures uh, uh of david cameron and george osborne in the bullingdon club uh was published in the daily mail and i think they got sued for it so there's obviously a great deal of sensitivity uh about publishing these pictures of bullingdon club photos people saying well it's a private photograph you're not allowed to and if you do we're going to uh, take you to court uh, and so there's been a reluctance to publish those photographs 
photographs, but I know you've managed to get loads of these old photos of the Bullingdon Club boys. How did you manage to do that? So, well, I did quite a large article on about exactly what happened in the Independence about eight or so months ago. A lot of them are just were just hanging on the walls of a tailor called Eden Ravenscroft. Now, that's the tailor that makes the very famous Bullingdon outfit, which is reputed to cost around three and a half thousand pounds. And interestingly, I also dug up a, an old pamphlet called The Rules of the Club, and the, from 1850, the uniform back then is exactly the same as it was as it is now. Now, effectively, a lot of these photos. A lot of them, some of them circulate online. You can find them in very old image archives. A lot of them are in college archives, so not really publicly accessible except to researchers or professional journalists. But I guess what surprised me was that no one had really done this before, uh, even for the photos that were in public domain, which include some very famous people, Cecil Rhodes, King Edward VIII. There's another one with... Uh, uh, Archibald Primrose, Earl of Rosebery, Prime Minister in the 1890s, that have just never been discovered. But the most interesting ones were the ones on the wall of Eden Ravenscroft, especially as one of the photos there was a was one of David Cameron, which had never been seen before or never been published before. Now, the Bullingdon started as a cricket club. I couldn't quite believe this back in the 1780s. Uh, but was it really about cricket? <sighs> so... And the interesting thing is, is a lot of their old match logs still survive, and it's very evidently obvious that they weren't very interested in cricket at all. It has them playing a lot of cricket clubs, the Marylebone Cricket Club, for one that says, Bullingdon lose by nine wickets. Bullingdon out, all out for 64, or in one, in one case, the, the most recent match register just has, Bullingdon gave up the match after, after a couple of overs. So it was... The cricket club was kind of a veneer to give some sort of respectability to it. It certainly doesn't sound like a dream team to run the country, does it? No, not particularly. And I think that's one of the things that often comes in for criticism with the club, is that getting into the club is almost entirely dependent on wealth, particularly landed wealth. There is no... You don't have to be particularly intelligent or socially savvy or anything to get into the Bullingdon Club. It is basically just the richest of the rich. Now, what about this uh, business of, of um, Boris Johnson whispering? Well, I didn't whisper it. I was saying it quite loudly. Omerta, omerta. Is that true? So that's an account I have gotten from a journalist uh, from Sebastian Shakespeare, who now writes the Daily Mail. Uh, he actually wrote... There's an old book, a very fascinating old book, from the night from published in 1988, called The Oxford Myth, which has a contributions from a number of people. One of which is actually Boris Johnson, and he basically in, in this Sebastian Shakespeare writes an article where he interviews someone from David Cameron's Bullingdon Club, gives gives them an on the record interview, and he said that whenever he's tried to talk to this about with the discuss this with Boris Johnson in the future, he, well, Boris just whispers Omerta, Omerta to him, just means silence, silence, or code of silence. That said, the code of silence is, is far from inviolable. I've had quite a number of, of, of old members speak to me, mainly off the record, and uh, some of them in particular aren't exactly particularly proud of their past, for instance. They kind of wish it had never happened, or, or now that they see everyone they know from the club in very high positions in, in society, they might start to feel a little bit embarrassed. Well, let's look at some of those. Um, there's Lord Halifax uh, uh, during World War II uh, was the guy who was seen as the most Nazi uh, British uh, lord uh, who Rudolf Hess went to try and meet up with in 1941. There's also more more modern uh, version of the Bullingdon Club, the Dukes of Norfolk, Northumberland, Westminster, Roxburgh and Buccleu. Uh Now, I noticed also that the Duke of Buccleu back in the Second World War was close to King George VI as the Lord Steward of the Royal Household, but he accompanied Lord Brockett to celebrate the Hitler's 50th birthday. It was a matter of personal delight to Hitler that the Duke, a man who served in the very court of Britain's royal family, was there, and Buccleu was opposed to any war with the Nazis. When it did break out in 1939, he joined something called the Peace Aims Group to try and uh, urge a truce 
with Germany, keeping all, letting keep Hitler keep all the lands he'd stolen in Europe. So you've got some interesting characters here. More modern one, uh, Rupert Soames uh, and the Rothschilds family. Jacob uh, Rothschild is apparently worth uh, seven billion, although uh, a chap. Uh, called Kevin Carr, who we have on this show quite regularly, uh, Nick, who used to work for the Sunday Times Rich List, would probably disagree. Uh, I mean, this, is, this really is a, 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 a pretty impressive list of people, uh, including names like Von Bismarck and, and, as you said, Cecil Rhodes. Yeah. Uh, some other interesting people, for instance. One is, is Nicky Oppenheimer, who used to be uh, chairman of, uh, chair of uh, De Beers, the mining group that was set up by Cecil Rhodes. Uh, it's not just Tories as well. There's a UKIP figure, quite a senior UKIP figure, uh, Stuart Wheeler, who was treasurer of the party until 2014, used to be a large Tory donor, donated quite a lot directly to UKIP. So there's that influence there as well. It's, it's far from just the Tories. Um, Lord Longford, who was a Labour peer until very recently, was in the club in, in 1925. It's, it's really quite a staggering list. Uh, I'm sure others will come to me. Uh, Tom Lawson, who was son of uh, Chancellor Nigel Lawson, I did a piece for Byline on what happened there. Uh, in 2000, the club got effectively smashed up a marquee and it took 30 cops to shut that particular party down. Now, th- th- this is uh, all verified. It's been reported on it. That was reported on in Parliament at the time, except Bullingdon Club as not that much was known about it then, it never really got that much traction. OK, what about stories about the uh, Prime Minister, though, uh, David Cameron? And have there been denials, and have you managed to get to the bottom of any of them? So there's the one, the, the one story that everyone knows, or that, that has been commonly reported by Cameron, about Cameron, is how a bunch of them all spent uh, the night in a cell, uh, in 19 this was in 1987 boris was there as well however i've managed to get accounts from the time and cameron has always denied he was there now that's not true at all cameron definitely was there what happened is they effectively they threw they they smashed a restaurant window the police were called they got chased down into the the botanical gardens of oxford and a couple of them managed to get away um, of that couple who managed to get away, there was David Cameron and Boris Johnson who managed to slip down a side street. And one of the quotes that was given about it, this quote wasn't originally gotten by me, this was originally published in, in the Financial Times uh, about five years back, was that they always joked that the, the two that ran from the police would be the two that ended up running for Parliament and then running the country many, many years later. Um, I mean, is it fair to say that uh, as part of your Bullingdon Club membership, you're rewarded for doing as much damage as possible, and it's a kind of way of institutionalising bad behaviour? Well, one of the common allegations that is made is that these people, when they do all these things when they're younger, that yes, not only are they encouraged, one of the guys told me that it was, they kind of made a fetish out of doing as much damage as possible, but it's also that if you're a group of 10 very wealthy people who are going to probably go on to very important things in, in society, everyone's got dirt on each other. It means that everyone will stick together later in life because they all have the dirt, they all have the dirt on each other. They effectively all have, have some form of influence, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. But, I mean, it's also a bit worrying is that they might start doing the same sort of damage to the country and to us. Yeah. Well, that... I think probably outside of my expertise, but there are pretty. It's not difficult to draw parallels. If, if I, t- I tell you what, I'll, I'll, at this point, Nick, I'll bring in old Labour Oxford economist Martin Summers. I mean, Martin's an old Oxford student, not the same uh, college. I mean, which college did you go to, Martin? I went to St Catherine's College. Charwell Polytechnic, as the, some of the posher colleges used to refer to. Uh, I mean, Nick's, Nick's come out with a pretty amazing uh, bunch of dirt, I suppose, on these people, and it is worrying. Certainly, if, uh, if the, they're encouraged to do damage, to commit crime, uh, in order to have dirt on each other, so that then they can possibly be blackmailed in the future, or they'll keep quiet, as we were hearing the, the mafia a murder sign. But what when these people are let leash on a, on a country, on an economy? Well, I mean, I think you can compare them to something like the Skull and Bones Society at Yale, 
and Harvard in the in the US. The, these elite kind of clubs for the super wealthy, uh, where they you know they basically do things which uh, you know leads to them having dirt on each other, etc. And of course, the Bullingdon Club uh, is not entirely Tory, but pretty much so. I mean, certainly. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, but uh, you have to go to Eton to be in the Bullingdon Club, do you not? I mean, could, perhaps you could enlighten me there. I was presumed the majority of people come from Eton, not, not exclusively. About probably about 70, 70 odd percent do. Uh, George Osborne went to went to St Paul's, and not everyone goes to Eton, but it definitely helps. Uh, Nick, also, what about deaths? Because there have been some deaths associated with the bullying club, some quite nasty ones, haven't there? And also, I mean, drug-taking, it seems a little bit tame compared to talking about the people that have died. So one story that I found that is all on record, is all has been through the courts, actually, was in 1977, where a couple of guys and one of them in particular, the driver, were in the Bullingdon Club at the time and were apparently, according to a source I have, coming back from one of their dinners. And effectively, the guy... Now, I have to make perfectly clear here that he was not convicted of drunk driving. He was convicted of dangerous driving causing death after quite a, quite a long trial. Uh, now, you can find, see a nice photo of him in the Bullingdon Club from that exact year, uh, gets up with a fine and a driving ban, effectively. Uh, now, he crashed into a car and he killed four other people, uh, one of which was uh, a Chelsea footballer, quite a well-known guy called uh, Peter Housman. Um, now, as for why this has never come out, I'm not entirely sure. Either people have kind of kept the omerta about it, or because it was quite uh, it was about 10 years before Cameron or, or, or Osborne were involved, it's never been directly linked to them. I thought what that showed a, a bit more is that a lot of these people will do da whatever kind of damage to property it is or, or damage to life, but almost they almost never suffer any sort of consequences for it, if, if that makes sense. The police will let them go after a, ni after a night where they smash a restaurant up. And a couple of years ago, one of them... One of the, a restaurant owner wanted to have the group charged and the police refused to do it. This was back in 2004. Um, yeah, effectively, it's not even so much what they do, but the fact that they always get away with it. Yeah, so, I mean, it's almost taken as read the drugs, I suppose. Uh, but, but what about being banned from Oxford? Because I know, uh, they, you know they've been to so many different premises where the owners have got fed up with having the place smashed up that they're now having to sometimes actually go outside Oxford to have their events. No, they haven't all the they they've been banned, I think, since the eighteen nineties from meeting with it meeting inside Oxford. And sometimes they'll book, for instance, under an assumed name. Uh I mean no, they would never be able to book somewhere under the the Bullingdon Club. The owners are just uh, uh, for instance the party that I I actually w witnessed myself last year, they just booked under a uh, under an assumed name. Uh and generally, if they're found out to be the Bullington Club, which happens, they just get kicked out of the establishment. Now, I suppose one of the most worrying things about this is not... It's a bit like the, M Martin was saying about like the skull and bones in the United States, is that it's not just something that happens at Oxford and a bit of fun that then gets forgotten about, Nick. Because I know you've uh, put together some evidence that the, the Bullington Club people regularly meet up, actually, after uh, they've long left Oxford. Yes, so... And I don't want to, uh, I'm not going to say how I know this, but I know at, at, at least two occasions, one of which has been reported in, uh, in uh, was, was reported, I think, in the diary of Standard about seven years ago, where they all met up to do, uh, this was just when Boris was first running for mayor, so a little bit longer, and about six of them from the same club met up to do a fundraiser for them. I also know that they often, or at least once in the last couple of years, have had a reunion dinner at the house of one of the guys who was in Cameron and Boris's club, and Cameron and Boris were all there for it. Now, you can say, OK, well, they're just catching up with university friends, but when you have people from that, for that same club, you know, writing about them in national newspapers favourably, or you have... Cameron, in one case, appointed one of the guys he was in the Bullingdon Club with to oversee a, a panel on state school spending. 
it's difficult to say they're just catching up with old friends when it's clear that actually in some cases they may be having influence on policy. Now, Nick, um, whereabouts can people follow your work online and, and, and keep up with what you're up to? Because I know you did, a, I mean, I'll put a link on our show page at thisweek.org.uk uh, to your article, recent one in the Daily Beast, which has got a lot of this stuff in it, which, which really, uh, you know, drew my attention to, to you doing this. I mean, there doesn't seem to be anybody in the London media doing this, just you as a freelance digging it out. But where can we follow your work online? So I'm, I've got a quite a large series of, of pieces coming, of which I've already done about four on byline.com. I want to go through each of the photos, who was in it, if we know anything about what happened there. I'm also a contributor, as you said, to the Daily Beast. And I have been tweeting some of my material out. My Twitter handle is at Nick T. Much, M-U-T-C-H. I think there's also something else worth saying here, and that is that uh, we, you know, failed to identify quite a lot of people in those photos. So we want to kind of uh, have a kind of wanted competition, so people can have a look at those. And if you can identify uh, who they are, some of the uh, individuals who were in the Bullingdon Club, uh, sort of ten, twenty years ago, some more recently, uh, it'd be quite nice to have a whole list of who they were, uh, and then to be able to see those photographs of them. Here's the really interesting thing: is that of, of all the photos, most of them are now. However, all the photos between 1987 and 1992 when Cameron, Osborne and Boris were in the club have all had the names scrubbed from the bottom of them. There's one in particular of David Cameron in 1998 where the names have been scrubbed and none of the other... About two of, I managed to identify two or three other people in that photo. The rest of them are unknown. They could be MPs, they could be financiers. There's another one in 1990 where I've not identified anyone. There's one person who I suspect is a is actually a very high-ranking Tory MP. I'm not going to name them because they've denied it to me, and I, I haven't had anyone positively identify them for me. But if anyone was to look at the photo and go, oh, that's so-and-so, well... Yeah. Fantastic. Well, let's make sure those are up online somewhere, very easy to have a look at, so people can scan them in, uh, blow up the photos, blow up the faces, and see if oh, sorry, not, not not in an explosive way, but obviously you know, expl- no, to make the faces bigger, so you can see exactly who they are. Also, Nick, one of the one of the main reasons that I wanted to uh, to get you on to to, to, to it is because. This, I mean, this is extremely damaging to the Tory party to see that so many of their senior people, uh, Boris, uh, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, the Mayor of London, uh, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer are, in, are in, from this club. It does look as if this is basically a little private club running the country. If I, if I can actually but, add, add one more name to that that I d- only discovered recently is a guy named Philip Dunn, who is a minister. He's in he's, uh, uh, Minister for Defence Procurement. Uh, so that's another minister who's in the club. I, th- I, I believe there's a couple more that I have yet to find, but that's just another example. This is some ongoing work, isn't it? Uh, yes, very good that we're talking about education just after we speak to you, because this is it's like when you leave school, you think you finish your education. No, think again, uh, because you you put a piece together for the Daily Telegraph, didn't you, uh, in the run-up to the elections last year? Can you just, just tell us briefly what happened there? Um, but. That's effectively true. This was probably about two weeks before the election. I had a, um, I spoke to two of their very senior reporters, uh, rather not name names, and they told them about the story that I had about all of these photographs, and they were extremely keen to do the story. Uh, came down to Oxford, discussed it with me several times on the phone, probably spent about three or four hours going over the story with them. All of a sudden, complete radio silence. Wasn't sure why. They never told me why. I called about a week later. They said they had, they'd have to talk to someone high up and see what was happening now. Never heard anything again. That Sunday, which was just before the election, which was where the piece was originally going to be published, well, I mean, it was full of stories about how the Conservative government was the greatest government of all time and George Osborne was the greatest Chancellor since William Gladstone... You can effectively make your own mind. Well, I think Ma- Martin Martin would, would probably beg to differ. Is, is George the greatest Chancellor since Gladstone? No. <laughs> anyway, look, listen, Nick, that's been fascinating talking to you, and we'll be definitely following your work and hope to have you on again sometime. And let us know if you have any more revelations about these people, because I think we're supposed to be living in a democracy, aren't we? Not in this kind of uh, small uh, club of violent toffs running everything uh, i'll just leave the final word with you with you nick um so 
I guess what I, one thing that I've always uh, tried to put out is that I don't think this is just about how the country is run now. This is the country's history. This goes back to the 1790s, and you've got the most prominent people in the world here. And I think the fact that still people very powerful try and shuttle this information down is effectively what really annoys me that is that this is history is you can't really under this is one of the most kind of essential clubs to understand the british class system and they effectively don't want the truth about how the british class system runs to be revealed and that's one thing that i want to try to do is make that kind of contribution to to history effectively by showing this club for all its faults and for all its occasional good things what it is and what its place is in british history okay nick much freelance journalist at byline.com thanks very much for joining us on the politics show thanks your difference is our strength on bristol's bcfm 93.2 and now I'm joined in the studio by Christine Townsend. Thanks for waiting patiently uh, there, Christine. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, you have a few things to say uh, about our education system here in Bristol. I just wondered if you just like, have, any, have any comments on what we just heard there, because I'm pretty shocked to hear that uh, that things like the, uh, the uh, just the identity of people who are in this Bullingdon Club uh, is being kept secret, and that if a newspaper publishes a photograph, they get sued. Uh, I think it's something like twenty, thirty thousand pounds the daily mail had to pay for just publishing a, fi- a picture of the prime minister it seemed like that should be their job well yeah i think i would agree um i'm, I'm pretty shocked really uh, how much information this guy is kind of informing us about but what i find interesting is that clearly these people go back a long way um they were educated at school together because they were all at eton they all then went to the same college at, in oxford and now they're all running the government um and it seems that they've got the judicial system and the police in the back pocket of some of that establishment if there are people going to court and they're not necessarily you know they're not necessarily getting the um the sentences that ordinary people would get if they did some really serious dangerous driving and killed somebody